Now I'm struggling this morning. Eric, help me out here. Let's say good morning to the House Majority Leader, Delegate Eric Halsoda. Eric, good morning to you. Hey, good morning, gentlemen. You know, the other day uh, when I was listening, it was it was pretty nice to hear you had a general, an admiral, a lieutenant colonel, and a queen. All of the same <laughs> and, and the and the queen outranks them all. <laughs> she does. If, if not, she'll tell us she does. <laughs> yeah. And I was looking forward to being on the radio with Mike Height because that's what you told me. It would be just you and Mike today. So Mr. Uh, Height is not here. Yeah. yeah, I know. So. I can't explain his absence. Do you he's think? Sleeping. Yeah, <laughs> is it possible, Eric, that he's afraid of taking you on with a uh, oh, question like and that. answer this morning? He's no, intimidated. No, no, he does a good job. I'm, I'm very proud of him. He's going to be. A, he's actually a, him and Hornby. I'm, I'm proud of them both. They're doing real good jobs down there in Charleston. But since Mike's not here today, now's the time to take advantage of it. Now <laughs> you can tell him, tell what you really think, Eric. <laughs> that's true. That's true. He can't refute anything today. <laughs> I just, I just got a text. He's, he's you know, we're coming in a couple minutes all red in the face, huffing and puffing, angry as a old hornet. I just got a text from Height saying, running late. I said, we are killing you. <laughs> oh, like Gilstrap did in his book. <laughs> Eric, let's talk about the October revenue numbers. There was a surplus, a modest one, but nevertheless, it came uh, in above projections. That's right. Uh, you know, for the year to date, uh, we've estimated 1.5 billion. We've collected 1.8 billion. So year to date, we're up 242 million dollars. Now, for the month of October, I'll go over the numbers, and I know this is dry for your listeners, but I try to give them as much information as possible. So, month ending October 31st, personal income tax, we estimated. And these are rough numbers, 179 million. Collections came in at about 189, so we're up about $10 million. A consumer sales tax, it was estimated for the month of October that we would collect uh, right around 125 million, 500,000, but we only collected 125 million, 188,000, so we were down 311,000 from our estimates. Uh, severance tax. Severance tax, we estimated $3 million, but we came in a minus $37 million. And then our consumer net, uh, or excuse me, our corporate net income tax, we estimated right around $10 million for the month of October, and we came in at $26 million, so we had saw an increase of $16 million over estimates. So overall, the state's doing very well. We had a modest, uh, like you mentioned, uh, increase for the month of October of $7.4 million. Eric, so, do you read anything into those numbers, Eric? I don't. I don't. Uh, once again, you're going to see November and December probably the sales tax is going to come in a lot stronger, obviously, with Thanksgiving and Christmas. So everything's moving right along pretty well. The interesting one, uh, Eric, is the uh, personal tax, uh, yeah. income tax, 179, uh, projected 189 in actuality. Is that due to a larger workforce, or has the salaries gone up? What's what's prompted that increase? Well, I did uh, do a little Google search of the state of the economy, and it looks like personal income um, has increased. Earnings have increased in about 48 states. So West Virginia, one of them, seeing a 3.5% increase. So overall, I think it's an economy that's still fairly strong in West Virginia. Uh, our energy sector is still going fairly strong. Now, keep in mind, I just mentioned that we had a uh, we had estimated $3 million, but we saw a $37 million decrease. But we also had payouts to our local state governments uh, of right around $74 million dollars. So that's why you're seeing, you know, a little decrease uh, because our severance tax collections, every year we make payments to local governments. So each, you could, I don't know that each uh, county got it roughly $1.3 million, but that's roughly what it equates to, 55 counties at $1.3 million. That's about a $74 million payout to the counties. Now, uh Refresh me, and I think I'm right on this. The counties that actually provide some something of severance, uh, such as coal yes. or gas, those counties get a larger return than the they counties do. such as Berkeley County, which is they, not. They they do, and I just did a little yeah. 
rough math there that if you if if it was an equal dis- distribution, but it's not. Sure, but you are correct. So, but it's uh, but also severance tax. You made the comment that this uh, early part in the year is when the payback to the county, uh, but uh, severance uh, tax does is is fairly volatile, it up is. and down. But there's no reason to think it's going to be down for the year, is it? I don't think so. Yeah. Keep in mind, we generally collect between 300 to $400 million in severance tax every year. The last couple of years, we saw a huge increase, excuse me, because coal prices were very, very high. Uh, but that's starting to come back down to the levels that we're used to. Now, the consumer sales tax is another one. It's, it went down ever so slightly. Uh, what was the reason for that? I don't know that there was a reason, Bill. I just think uh, they just had a little bit better projections. Sure. I mean, at 125 million five hundred thousand was the estimate, and they actually came in at 125 million one hundred and eighty-eight thousand eight hundred six dollars. I mean, that's pretty close. Yeah. So. So in total, it uh, says two things. One, uh, the esti- estimation uh, is fairly accurate, fairly exact, and also the economy of the state is doing quite well. That's that's the indication that I'm trying to convey to yeah. your uh, listeners today, yes. And you're very effective, Eric, in doing that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and keep in mind, uh, any naysayers out there, we have a, a nice rainy day fund of uh, $1.1 billion. Yeah. Uh, also, this session, we parked another $400 million into a uh, personal income tax fund, and we put an additional $230-some million into our rainy day fund, so... You know, we're being, we're being very prudent, good stewards of the taxpayers' dollars. And and that the, the, the process is, as we go through the year, uh, if there's still surpluses, and at the back end of the budget, you may use some of those surpluses to address items that you were not addressed during, during the session. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. We have, obviously, we have several options. You could uh, choose to uh, make, uh, make an appropriation. You could invest uh, in uh, other things, you could uh, give back and more in tax relief. So there's, we have plenty of options to do. So. Now, now the uh, the trigger uh, for the net, for 10 percent tax release in the future. Yeah. Do you anticipate that trigger it will be met this coming year? I do, I do. And like I said, next July is when the uh, CPI numbers are uh, released, and by August revenue will make. Uh, their analysis, and uh, I do suspect that we will see another 10% uh, cut to the personal income tax. So that'll get us up to the 30% originally. If you remember, the House had passed a bill with the governor asking for a 30% personal income tax reduction. We've covered this before, but I don't recall the answer. How much does uh, every 10% of an income tax cut cost the state? Well, this uh, last income tax cut that we had usually... The rule of thumb is uh, for every um, 10%, uh, let me think here, it was about uh, $450 million, I believe. So you're on pace if the months match right now for a surplus of somewhere around $750 million. Exactly. So if you had, if you take 10% of that away, $450 million, you'd still have a $300 million surplus. Surplus. Or, like I said, the legislature could uh, decide to appropriate the whole amount for a tax cut. I mean, that's that's the, the uh, decision that we're going to have to make probably next July, what we call our 13th month, when all the accounts are reconciled. And uh, that's usually when we have a special session to make those decisions. So, Eric, do you feel the projections, the revenue projections for this fiscal year were more realistic than they were in 23? Well, I've said all along, it's very hard to get them exact. Uh, you, you'd like to see them somewhat close. They've been fairly close, but keep in mind, we had, you know, you had a year where coal was just, you know, selling for you know, an ungodly amount of money per ton. Normally, like I just mentioned, we generally only bring in about 300 to $400 million a year, but when you start seeing, you know, your severance tax collections up around... 800 almost 900 million dollars it's just it's hard to make you know an accurate projection eric we've asked the softball questions yeah. but the badger has arrived oh. so watch yourself now okay. he's in a bad yeah. mood too he's in a you. bad mood we were picking on him he's in a bad mood and i was listening too <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
He came in, I turned the mics down, he just started working Bill over. I mean, he was physical. <laughs> yeah, and he has fire in his eyes, Eric. It'd be oh, very my, nice if oh, you'd come my. in. Hey, good morning, Mike. How good, are you doing this morning? Uh, good morning, and, and yeah. thank you for the kind words, sir. <laughs> At least a few of them, right? <laughs> hey, Eric, if, if you could a little bit talk about um, – you know the the tax cuts we had last year, the the twenty one uh, plus percent uh, tax cut, and and with the revenues the way they are now, what would the next tax cut kick in? The way the, the law was written, that it, it's an automatic kick in. Um, what do we have to hit for that to kick in? And do you anticipate that next um, reduction to kick in? Okay. Hey, I'm glad you came to the party late. We just talked about it, but we'll talk about it again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he was well, walking must, from his car down been, the hallway. Yeah, must have been always getting out of the car. <laughs> All right, so for those listeners who didn't listen a minute ago. What, <laughs> we'll just say Mike Heintz. <laughs> what will what, happen uh, next July, the CPI numbers will come out. And uh, if you remember, the triggers are based off of, off of a mathematical calculation based off your base revenue of 2019, those CPI numbers, when they come out, the tax uh, secretary of revenue will look at that number and use it in, as a multiplier against the 2019 base revenue. And it's a very simple mathematical process. If there is a, um, an increase, remember the way the bill was written, they could see up to a 10% uh, um, cut in your personal income tax, but it is tied to inflation, so it would depend on what the inflation is at the time. If you had 1% inflation, you could see a 9% income tax cut. So, and then starting in, remember, tax years are beginning January 1, so in January 1 of 2025, the new rates would go into effect, and whatever that percent is, that's how much of an income tax cut that the uh, citizens would see working citizens would see does that make sense yeah the, the working citizens is a very important part the, well yeah you well, have we, to have earning yes you have to have earned income in order to get a personal income tax cut so yeah eric let's uh uh let's move to the elections you're running for auditor uh how's the campaign going who's going to be running against you uh information well, right now it's very grueling. Uh, I'm heading to uh, Harrison County tonight, or excuse me, Barber County, and then on Saturday I head to Harrison County. Tuesday I head to Raleigh County, so I'm getting out there. Um, I'm, I've been, let's see, I've been to Ohio County, Taylor County, Greenbrier County, Doddridge County, uh, Kanawha County, Putnam County. I've been all over. I'm crisscrossing all across the state, so... I'm getting out there, introducing myself to, you know, other people across the state. Keep in mind, nobody really knows me outside of Berkeley County, obviously. I've been a delegate for, uh, I'm in my 14th year. Uh, so it's imperative that I get out there and, you know, I have this little um, slogan that I tell people, say householder until it becomes a household name. Uh, that's the key because I'm in a race for name ID. That's all this race is about. Yeah. So. Now, who's running against you, Eric? I have two other op opponents, but keep in mind they're undeclared right now. I've actually, when I filed my pre-candidacy, I filed as a state auditor. Um, but the other two op opponents, sort of, are undeclared. It's uh, Commissioner Jackson and Caleb uh, Hanna out of Nicholas County. Okay, so Commissioner Jackson out of Jefferson County, is that the same? Yes. yes. I was yes. thinking she was running for treasure, so she's actually running against your uh, yes. auditor. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. And now, Caleb, like I said, I'm the only one who has filed a pre-candidacy to mm -hmm. run for state auditor. And, and Caleb's a, a younger delegate, in the, but he's been, what, uh, four years now, three no, years? No, he's in his uh, fifth year right now. In his now, fifth year? Okay. Yeah. As, as a delegate. Uh, from Nicholas County. I want to ask you a question from one of our listeners on uh, our viewers on Facebook, Eric, and that had uh, to do with the use of continued tax cuts. Damon Wright, I'm concerned all these cuts will not provide the needed increases for state workers, foster care, roads, mental health, etc. And there'll be a push to privatize many services, which could cost people more in the long term. What's your response to that? Well, the response is we've built in that the legislature has the ability to do a 5% spend. 
So if the legislature decides to invest in uh, deferred maintenance, they could do that. If the legislature defi- decided to do uh, pay increases for state workers, they could do that. So they have the ability up to 5%. Uh, a state pay raise across the board is about $234 million. That's 5%. So. Is that planned for this legislative session? Has, uh, has there been discussion about that? I, I haven't heard, uh, not to say that it can't happen, but uh, I'm not sure. Eric, uh, we hear a lot of talk every time a new business comes in, new yeah. core, uh, Procter & Gamble, Macy's before that, that a lot of the workforce comes from out of the state, comes across state line. Uh, is there a rule of thumb which you folks use to gauge how much as far as taxes that these companies will provide? And I guess I'm talking about in personal income tax. Do you have a rule of thumb that says a certain amount? You're getting way out uh, and over and above my bailiwick. I'm sure the revenue and 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 the uh, Secretary of Commerce. I'm sure that's a decision that the executive team kind of factors. I mean, we normally would only see a uh, an analysis done. And for instance, if there if there is a business that's interested in coming, like Nucor, when Nucor decided we saw an economic impact to the state. And they listed, uh, you know, the total economic impact and personal income tax collections, and and uh, you know, we only normally see that, you know, the time that we're actually getting a chance to, if we're going to appropriate any money, if that makes sense. Yeah, it actually does. And I, I question when I was when I was asking the question, was a hard, fast analytical rule. Uh, I think we do benefit. I know there's a lot of challenges well you get some of your workforce from out of state but i think the state still benefits in so many different ways well yeah i mean we can't build a wall around the state Mm -hmm. obviously we have our residents that travel to maryland that travel to virginia every day we have an influx of -of out-of-state people coming into west virginia so you're you're going to see that population move movement uh depending on you know whatever's uh you know I've said before, you know, our area, the state of West Virginia in in general, for for many, many years, we've been losing people because people are voting with their feet. They're moving to other states in search of prosperity. As we start to increase the prosperity here, you're going to see an influx of people moving to this area to take advantage of it. You could have someone who's sitting in Maine right now who says, that's it, I'm tired of living in Maine. I want to come to West Virginia for whatever reason. You know what I mean? So you see that happening all the time. But uh, I think uh, if we just keep the course, we're starting more and more people are finding out about West Virginia. We're, I think we're making an environment that's very conducive you know, to start a business. Uh, we did very good things with our regulatory side. You know, we're lowering our taxes. We made West Virginia a right-to-work state. We, we uh, repealed prevailing wage, so we're doing all the right things. I'd like to go back to uh, Damon's question real quick, and and uh, Mr. Uh, Majority Leader, if you think I'm wrong, please correct me. But I think the legislature. Jump in on that mic. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> I think the legislature recognizes that there are, there is still work to be done in the corrections area. Uh, that we didn't totally fix that um, in this special session, and we know we're going to have to work on it in the the regular session. And there's still CPS work um, that has to be done. That there's some still some crisis there. There's still. Uh, direct care worker shortages in the the waiver programs and we know we're going to have to make some uh, adjustments there and spend more money there and I think the legislature is aware of all those things and so the the extra money that that Damon is talking about that five percent will get eaten up pretty quick um, with those those key things that we know we're going to have to address in this next session you're right and there's always a huge need I mean we have needs all every each and every time obviously things haven't been done for many many years and uh you know we're trying to work as fast as we can any surpluses that we have at the end of, end of the year the one-time money we made investments in higher ed we made in some investments in corrections uh so i think you're going to see a continuation of that we know that there's deferred maintenance costs at higher ed and corrections and other facilities with uh, our state hospitals 
So the push is to do something, and we are doing something. We're being very proactive, but uh, once again, uh, it just takes a little time. House Majority Leader Eric Householder with us uh, via telephone. Uh, Eric, when is your next interim session? They're starting on November the 12th through the uh, 14th. And where will this one be held? This one will be in Wheeling. In Wheeling, okay. And is there anything specific that you'll be addressing at that time? Uh, no, I mean, I've, we've got our agenda. I, I serve on the Joint Committee on Government and Finance, so I'll be at that meeting. But uh, I haven't even looked at the agenda yet. I'll look at that next week. You you go into your last year as a delegate as you're seeking a statewide office, and there are many folks who are doing the same thing. The governor's in his last uh, year in his term, and, and many of the uh, uh, officers uh, at the state level are also seeking other, other offices, too. Yeah. Is there any concern that this becomes a lame duck session with so many people looking to move out of their current situation? No, because the state, I mean, the legislature, we have a lot of things that we want to run. We're going to make sure that we continue to operate like we always have. We're going to have our caucus bills. Obviously, Mike just mentioned some needs. You're going to see things with foster care. You're going to see things on corrections. All that's going to come to light. So we'll stay busy, trust me. Eric, a philosophy that uh, Craig Blair had and you've had and several others, this flatline budget, yes. uh, and it has served us well. I think yes. it's, uh, nobody can challenge the, the success and the benefits. But do you see a period uh, that we would drift away from the more rigid flatline budget to go back to a more, uh, uh, the, more lenient funding? The only thing that I would say is if you want to continue to grow government, and, and make government the focal point in West Virginia. I mean, for years we've talked about decentralizing state government. Uh, so if, you, if, if the plan is to make government bigger, then yes, go away from the flat budget. But if you want to control the rate of government and government spending, continue with the flat line budget, and uh, you'll, it'll be better for the citizens' pocketbooks in the long run. When we say grow government, yes. what, do we mean increased spending? Do we mean increased hiring? Uh, do we okay. mean increased reach of what the government does? Everything, all of the above. Because keep in mind, the more and more as the government grows, uh, it's like little uh, uh, fiefdoms down there. I mean, it's hard enough right now. We have what's called uh, in our budget, uh, oh, shoot, it's about $2 billion worth of money. Uh, it's not the general revenue account. I lost the See, that's what happens when you're rusty, when you're not the finance chair anymore. <laughs> but uh, anyways, uh, it, it's, uh, it's uh, special revenue. Sorry, I couldn't think of the word. But mm -hmm. uh, special revenue accounts are from the legislature passing bills that had some fee or some impact uh, to the legislation. And uh, these agencies build up large pots of money in these special revenues. And like I said, it's over $2 billion in they basically have carte blanche. Now, they do have to get uh, legislative approval to increase their spending authority, but, uh, you know, once again, if the answer or if the question is, do we want to continue to grow government and make government the focal point in West Virginia, then by all means do away with the flat budget. But if you're serious yeah. about smaller government and more money in the uh, citizen's pocketbook, then I hope you would uh, subscribe to the flatline budget. And the state will actually grow and prosper, and so will our citizens. I think the I think the people would be surprised at all the fees and and things that are charged from these agencies. Um, it might be well to have Mr. Hornby on, who's on the the rules committee, and um, deals with those fees and how agencies are coming to them on a regular basis, asking to increase fees. Um, without any reason to increase the fees it's not like they need additional funding or anything they just come and 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 request to to increase these fees and 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 eric's right they build up these these huge sums of money in a separate line item um and and they're just sort of like slush funds so um you have to have somebody on rules um and i i think delegate hornby's done a great job of uh keeping these these agencies in check when they start raising these fees well it's not like i can stop him from coming on the show he owns the well place. that, that you're correct <laughs> he's the mogul <laughs> and, and also uh mike i uh a uh side 
detriment to that is that at the end of the year, if you have a big budget, uh, you have undisciplined spending. You go out and spend on yes. things that you don't really need. So. Well, with these fees, since they're on a separate line item, mm-hmm. they don't even have to sweep it. I mean, they don't have to yeah. spend it. It can yeah. build up and build up over years and, and just become, like Eric said, these huge slush funds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, I'm going to have to get going Indeed. here today and to get back to work, but I appreciate all your old time. Thank, Thank you, Eric. Thanks, Eric. Have a yep. great day. See you guys. Yeah. Bye. Majority Leader Delegate Eric Council.